Hello, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center AASHTO Bike Guide Series webinar. Today's webinar is titled, Off-Road Facilities, Shared Use Path, Roadway Intersection Design, and we will be speaking with Eric Mongelli, PE, Director of Engineering at Tool Design Group, and Bill Schulteis, PE, Senior Engineer, Tool Design Group. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBIC Communications Manager. I will be facilitating today's webinar. All right, now I'd like to welcome and thank Eric and Bill for their presentations today. We will take questions at the end. Uh, Eric and Bill, please take it away. Okay, thanks, James. I just want to make sure that you can see my screen. Yes, you can. Okay, thanks. So, uh, um, just want to welcome uh, Folks coming back that have seen our prior webinars, and I also like to welcome new audience members. Uh, as James mentioned, this is the sixth in a series of seven webinars on the new Ashton Bike Guide. They will be talking about shared use path design, focusing on shared use path and roadway intersections. So we're going to be having a conversation on on uh, Twitter as we move along, and if you'd like to participate. You're welcome to join at Tool Design. And to keep the uh, discussion focused on this topic, please use the hashtag AASHTO or Bike Guide. It's a kind of a fun way to participate in the discussion that will be going around, on around the U.S. And our tool staff will be tweeting some of the main points of the webinar as we move along. So today's webinar. Uh, again, we'll focus on paths and roadway intersections, and we'll be mentioning some of the significant updates in the new guide. Uh, we'll, we'll talk in more detail about uh, these topics. Um, but just to hit the highlights, we'll talk about um, determining crossing types, explain the context of, of crosswalks and how that plays into path roadway intersections. We'll talk about how to determine the type of control needed at crossing. We'll talk about um, other engineering treatments that can enhance uh, crosswalks. We'll talk about side paths, crossings, and the, their challenges, and um, ideas to mitigate those challenges. And we'll also be talking about uh, restricting motor vehicle access to paths. So as I mentioned, this is the sixth webinar. The last webinar focused on the basics of path design. The two webinars prior to that focused on on-road bicycle facilities. The early webinars in the series uh, gave an overview of the new guide and talked about uh, planning for bicycle transportation. So we're not going to repeat those webinars. Moving forward now, we're finishing up Chapter 5 of the new guide. That's the Shared Use Path Design chapter. The next webinar will be November 6th, and we'll focus on bikeway maintenance and operation. As James mentioned, uh, as a participant of the webinar, you can get a discount on purchasing the guide. This is the web link uh, to get to the discount if you want to jot it down quickly. But as he mentioned, you don't worry, you don't need to. The, the, the link will also be in the email that's sent out to the webinar attendees. Give you a second if you're writing it down. OK. so. Just a little repeat from the prior webinars, but it's important to understand the basics of AASHTO and how it relates to other guides. AASHTO is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide technical support to states um, to help them efficiently and safely move people and goods. So AASHTO develops a set of uniform guidelines for transportation design. And just a little history on the bike guide. The last guide was published in 1999, was largely written between 1996 and 1998. The new guide is about twice the size of the old guide and in includes a lot of research and innovation that's happened over the last 15 years. So a couple key points. It's, it's important to know the distinction between standards and guidance. Standards are required in manuals such as the MUTCD and use terms such as shall. MUTCD is adopted through federal law, making it a standard. Uh, so items like uh, stop, stop sign shall be read uh, are governed by the MUTCD, and AASHTO uh, cannot contradict 
for the MUTCD. ASHTO issues guidance and uses terms such as should or may, uh, and this guidance can be deviated from using engineering judgment. Many times states and localities will adopt those guidelines as standards and oftentimes will add additional detail. Another key to understand is the difference between innovation and accepted practice. Innovation is allowed in MUTCD and ASHTO. Through a formal experimentation process, over time, uh, treatments can be experimented with and become accepted practice and eventually make it into the MUTCD and or ASHTO. So just to talk a bit about the relationship to some other manuals, I mentioned the MUTCD. That would govern signing and pavement markings. Uh, for path roadway intersections and aspects of, of signal design. Other guidance to consider is accessibility guidelines, such, such as PROAG, which would uh, speak to curb ramp design and other accessibility guidelines. Similar to the METCD, uh, the accessibility requirements are enacted by law and need to be adhered to. Uh, the Highway Capacity Manual also influences bike facility design primarily on-road facilities, but would come into play with path and roadway intersections, depending on the type of control that's used at the intersection. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So the, the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide is another guide that's out there. It's relatively new. It's developed by large urban cities. It covers a number of solutions, many of which are experimental and the prim primarily focused uh, on on-road facilities. The guide, the NACTO guide, is a great source of information for those treatments. And once those treatments go through the experimentation process and the design details and safety implications are clear, the next step would be to incorporate those treatments into AASHTO. AASHTO and NACTO are really uh, considered complementary. There are a number of design principles that are not covered in NACTO, which need to be understood by designers, things such as site distance, um, and there are a number of treatments in NACTO that are not in ASHTO. So we really need to think about them as uh, not either or, but uh, both working together. Uh, the ASHTO Green Book, that, that comes into play in Shared Use Path Design. Shared use path, shared use path Design really follows the principles of roadway design and use of items such as design speed and intersection site distance and basic geometric principles uh, are similar to roadway design. Many of the formulas for shared use path design are exactly the same or very similar to those in the Green Book. And it's always good to remind everyone about engineering judgment. Uh, any guideline cannot cover every possible situation. So guidelines give the engineering principles uh, and an understanding of the physics and the science behind the guidance that can be applied to various situations. So the key here is just to remember that uh, there is, you can use engineering judgment to uh, adjust the guidelines uh, to fit your situation. So just to hit the, the highlights of uh, some of the major content changes in, the, in Chapter 5 and focusing on path roadway intersections. Um, we'll go into more detail on these. And again, I mentioned them earlier, discussing crossing types, uh, how we select intersection control, and talk about um, other engineering treatments that can improve a, a crossing situation. So just to kind of start with the basics of good intersection design principles, they're actually similar to roadways. From a geometric standpoint, uh, providing right angle crossings, uh, short crossing distances um, are, are optimal. Providing adequate sight lines and having crossings at relatively flat and conspicu conspicuous locations is, is also key. Uh, with path crossings, it's also important to understand the needs of various users and understanding their speeds and characteristics. Just having a good understanding of of good pedestrian design actually goes a long way uh, to providing adequate crossings. One of the trickier aspects of, of path roadway intersections is, is assigning the proper right-of-way, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes.
And we have to remember that we're not just talking about crossings. We're, we're also talking about turning movements uh, to access the path, paths from on-road facilities. So it's just something to keep in mind if you're path crossing uh, where you have on-road facilities, we need to think about those turns as well. So uh, talking about crossing types, the guide really talks about three different crossing types, uh, mid-block, side path, and grade separated. Just to highlight the difference here, uh, Mid-block crossing is a crossing of a roadway that's outside the functional area of a roadway-roadway intersection. You can see the area circled in red. That's considered a mid-block crossing. Now, a side path crossing is a, is a path crossing of a roadway that's within the functional area of a roadway-roadway intersection and really where a normal crosswalk would be. And then the third crossing type Grade separated is where the path would go over or under the roadway. So these photos are just examples of those two main types. We've talked about mid-block and side path. On the left, mid-block crossing, not near a roadway intersection. On the right, side path crossing. And you can see here that bikes are having to contend with uh, turning vehicles. And we can't forget uh, about other path crossings, uh, paths cross sidewalks and paths cross other paths. And we'll talk about uh, some of the considerations for those. So we talked about some of the basics of path crossings. And now I want to build on that foundation by talking about a, a really key component. Uh, and that's crosswalk uh, mutual yielding behavior. And what we mean by that is that at a crosswalk, a driver uh, must stop or yield to a pedestrian in a crosswalk or just entering a crosswalk. And on the other side, a uh, bicyclist or a pedestrian cannot just move out in front of a motorist uh, if the motorist is too close to stop. So that's what we mean by mutual yielding. And that's key. That's a key component to keep in mind. So what is a, a legal crossing? Where does this come into play? So for, for mid-block locations, uh, you really need to mark a crosswalk to create a, a legal crossing. For side paths, uh, in many states, uh, a crosswalk exists whether there's a marking or not. We also need to consider um, other state laws as to how cyclists are treated at crosswalks. Do they need to dismount? Uh, and walk to be considered a pedestrian in a crosswalk. State laws can vary uh, in that regard. The guidance um, in, in the, the Ashto Bike Guide really considers that cyclists don't have to dismount. So uh, if cyclists stay mounted, the main distinction between bikes and pedestrians uh, is their approach speed. Cyclists can approach a crossing at a relatively high speed, where pedestrians are much slower and can stop uh, virtually instantly. So the concept of mutual yielding works pretty well for pedestrians, but it doesn't work as well for bicyclists approaching at higher speeds. So therefore, when we think about paths and we think about accommodating bikes, uh, we have to apply a, an additional control. Just the control and the mutual yielding behavior of a crosswalk is not enough. So now I want to focus on, on mid-block crossing and how we would determine that type of additional control. This, um, this shows a way that we apply the AASHTO guidance on how to consider a mid-block crossing. It's a bit of an iterative process, um, but we'll kind of step through it. And, uh, and then following slides, we'll kind of focus in on each of these um, steps. The first thing we think about are the basics of geometric design. And then we look at the roadway characteristics, the number of lanes, the speeds, the volumes, to see if a signal is needed, or even perhaps a grade separation. If we don't need a signal, then we try to apply the least restrictive control that's effective. And that would be having either the path or the roadway yield. 
So at that point, we need to evaluate site triangles to see if yielding will work. And if site distances won't work for yielding, then we have to go to stopping either the path or the roadway. And at that point, we need to determine who is stopped or, or made to yield, who has priority, the path or the roadway. But through this process, we really need to think about other treatments that can improve the crossing and may mitigate the need for a signal. Or perhaps there's some uh, design that we can do to open up sight lines and make yielding work. So it's not a true linear process. We have to, it's, it's an iterative process. So just kind of stepping through, um, again, we talked about this a bit earlier, geometric considerations. Make the crossing as close to 90 degrees as possible. Shortens the crossing distances and improve sight line. Also having the crossing relatively flat and conspicuous. Then thinking about the roadway that we're crossing. Again, we want to assess uh, the number of lanes, the speeds, the volumes, and, and determine is a signal needed. The FHWA study on the safety effects of marked versus unmarked crosswalks is actually a good source, uh, a good resource for thinking about this. It talks about what kind of crossing treatments are, are appropriate in just different situations. So if a signal is not warranted, then we want to install the least restrictive control that's effective. And over time, many designers have put up uh, stop signs on paths to protect path users at crossing. But when we put, on over, put up overly restrictive controls, many times they're, they're disregarded or they're treated as yield signs. So then when we really need it to use a stop sign, it's less effective. So that's the key. We want to try to use uh, yielding if possible. So we need to evaluate uh, the sight line. So the thing we need to think about here is, is what are the speed of the, of the users and the motorists approaching the, the intersection. For the path, we use the fastest user uh, that's anticipated, typically the adult bicyclist. Uh, in the last webinar, we talked about a general design speed for paths of 18 miles per hour, which is, uh, uh, would be appropriate. For the roadway approach, we, we think about the, the design speed of the roadway. So the idea here is to uh, provide an unobstructed view of enough of the crossing facility so we can slow or stop to avoid a conflict. And there are two formulas uh, that are used, one for the roadway leg, A, and one for the path leg, B. And to simplify things in the guide, the formulas work whether the intent is to have the roadway yield or the path yield. I'm not going to go into details of the formula just to show you uh, kind of the basics. So if, if the yield site triangles can't be provided, then either the path or the roadway will have to stop. So when we think about approach site distance um, for a stop or for, for that matter a signal, we, need, we simply need to provide uh, stopping site distance on the path and the roadway. Now in the situation where maybe a yield situation or a stop situation where the path user has come to the edge of the road and they've stopped because of a conflict or because of a stop sign, and then they want to go ahead and cross. That's what we call a departure site triangle. In that situation, ideally, enough site distance is provided so the path user can judge a gap in crossing traffic. And the highway capacity manual actually has uh, the calculations for how to determine that. But again, if we go back to that mutual yielding behavior, uh, and we think, again, that a motorist has to stop for a path user just entering the crossing, then the key is, pro is providing, at a minimum, stopping sight distance for the roadway. So the next step, um, once we've determined whether we're, we're stopping or yielding, um, we have to determine which leg has priority, who is stopped, and, or who is made to yield. And things to consider here include the volume, speeds, and hierarchy of the trail and the roadway system. 
So if, for instance, if we consider a local street or a long driveway versus a regional trail, in that case we would stop or yield the road. So it's key to, to consider those factors looking at the roadway and the trail system. You would not always stop or yield the trail. And so this is just an example. Uh, this is a graphic in the guide that shows the signing and markings associated with stopping the roadway. So we have a stop sign on the roadway, stop bars on the roadway, perhaps uh, an advance warning sign saying stop ahead. And for the path, you simply have an intersection warning sign. It may have supplemental pavement markings. This is an example graphic of uh, yield control on the path. So the path would have the yield sign, yield pavement markings, uh, perhaps an advanced warning sign, the yield ahead. And for the roadway, uh, you, you see we have the, the path uh, crossing warning sign. And we can't forget about path crossing sidewalks and paths crossing other paths. For the, for the sidewalk leg of a, of a site triangle, if you're having a path approach a sidewalk, we want to we want to set up similar site triangles so we can avoid uh, conflicts. So the guide talks about a 15 foot um, length along the, the sidewalk of, of clear space and 25 feet along the path. And this uh, assumes a walking speed and a perception time for the pedestrian to, to perceive a conflict and stop. And this also assumes that a cyclist traveling at about their 85th percentile speed does not slow down or stop and passes by. Now for pass and pass intersections, you can actually use the site triangle formulas for yielding that I talked about earlier, except you would pick the formulas that use the path stopping site distance for both approaches. So now I'm going to turn things over to Bill, who's going to get into um, talking about some of the engineering treatments at crossings, and then he'll he'll also get into side path crossings. Great. Hello, everybody. This is Bill Schulteis, um, back in the seat here for the next round of training. Good to be with everybody again. So what I'm going to talk through is take you back to the flow chart that Eric had shown earlier as a, a potential process that you might undertake to design a trail intersection. And take you back to the, to the bottom piece of it where we talk about other additional crossing treatments or supplemental uh, engineering treatments and the importance of these treatments. Uh, as Eric mentioned, this process is meant to be iterative. and Throughout your design of a trail roadway intersection, you should be thinking about potential engineering treatments to supplement the crossing. This is a reminder, the, at mid-block crossings, it's required for the pedestrian to have a legal right to cross the roadway at that location for there to be a marked crosswalk in the majority of states. Uh, without a marked crosswalk, the pedestrian never really has uh, that legal protection if they're in the crosswalk and are hit uh, by an approaching motorist. So the premise of the Astro Guide is that a marked crosswalk will be provided at all mid-block trail crossings. An implication of that um, understanding is, is going back to the Charlie Zagier research, uh, which is really critical to advancing pedestrian safety in the United States of considering additional engineering treatments under certain situations. And we think it's important to emphasize this point that uh, the, the, the research that uh, Mr. Zagier produced wasn't intended to be seen as a decision tree for marking or not marking a crosswalk. It was really to provide information uh, to designers of to raise some flags for them to understand that there are certain types of roadway conditions where just marking a crosswalk by itself is not enough, that other additional supplemental engineering treatments are required. These situations where roadways with four or more lanes of traffic, which were undivided, 
generally, or greater than 40 mile an hour operating speeds that didn't have uh, raised crossing islands where ADTs were greater than 1,200. And for roadways where a raised crossing is provided, but ADTs are, are higher than 1,500. So supplemental engineering treatments are required and recommended in these circumstances. Uh, the largest and most effective treatment, uh, or I shouldn't say the largest, but one of the most effective treatments you can provide to a trail at a trail crossing is to have, have a refuge island to allow for two-stage crossing and to shorten the exposure time in the roadway intersection. Uh, these are really highly recommended on multi-lane roadways, whether it's the multiple threat or, or where the user's crossing three or more lanes of traffic. The minimum width is six feet, but that's really a, a minimum. And it, if you think about a six-foot dimension, that's barely enough space to hold a single bicycle. Uh, if you've got a situation where there's a lot of uh, trail users in high volume, or you have trail users that, that operate with trailers or longer bikes, then you, you'd certainly like to try to have larger islands. Uh, so the preferred width in the guide actually talks about this as being a 10-foot desirable dimension. You should also consider the effect of platooning. If you have a situation where there's a lot of two-stage crossings, you may want a larger island just to have storage capacity for multiple users, whether it be five or six pedestrians or five or six bicyclists. Uh, so you should be cognizant of uh, your circumstances and have some understanding of the types of volumes that either exist or that are anticipated to exist if you're going to have a situation where you anticipate two-stage crossings. Another treatment that's been found to be highly effective at mitigating crashes and improving safety uh, for pedestrians and trail users is the advanced stop or yield line. This, the selection of one or the other will be based on state law, whether the law is stated as a motorist is required to stop for pedestrians in crosswalks or to yield the right of way to pedestrians in crosswalks. Uh, this is a standard MUTCD treatment. Uh, where the advance line, yield or stop line, is placed 20 to 50 feet in advance of the crossing. It is supplemented by a regulatory sign that says, uh, emphasizes that state law, whether it be stop or yield. Here's a great example from uh, Colorado. Uh, the placement of an advance yield sign, uh, you got a very generous uh, refuge island. Uh, it's more than 10 feet in width. And then you have the uh, yield here to pedestrian sign at the yield point. And then at the crossing, you have the supplemental uh, pedestrian warning sign. Now, for the warning sign, um, it's a new sign in the METCD in 2009. It's actually a trail sign where it combines the pedestrian symbol and the bicycle symbol. Uh, the the standard sign is shown in the symbol at the right. The photo on the left has the, the images flipped. Uh, but it's the same concept, where you can apply an advance sign uh, in advance of the, the crosswalk marking. And a factor of that distance will be based on the approaching motor vehicle speed and any geometric considerations you might have, be, be it uh, curves in the roadway that are horizontal or vertical that limit the motorist's ability to see the, the crossing as it comes up. And then at the crossing, you use the uh, downward arrow plaque to emphasize the point of the crossing. It's important to remember that these signs should not be used at locations that are stop controlled for the motorist, have a traffic, generally not be used where there's a traffic signal and where there's a yield sign. The motorist's attention should be focused on those regulatory signs, and adding this warning sign would potentially distract them from the, the regulatory sign. If you have a signalized intersection or an active warning, or if you are dis determined, if you determine through your design process that you require a signalized or an active warning, recommended that you reference and make sure that you're referencing the METCD for design uh, guidelines and placement information 
and installation information, as well as when it comes to signals operational details. Those are not explained in the ASTO guide. You find that in the METCD. That said, um, the thing you should also look to in the METCD is locations of where to put push buttons if they're required. As shown in this photo, this is a good example of a good location. It should be on the right-hand side where the, the cyclist doesn't have to dismount to activate and actuate the uh, push button. But generally, if you're designing for accessibility, the push buttons will always be in a proper location for cyclists. Again, you'll look to PROAG and to the METCD for uh, placement details. Here's an example um, of a potential hawk signal placement, pedestrian hybrid beacon use that, that could be applied at a mid-block trail crossing. We don't have an example of actual trail location. So this comes from uh, Portland's uh, Bicycle Boulevard treatment. Uh, but it's the same principle if this were a mid-block location where you could install the pedestrian hybrid beacon. So again, you'd go to the METCD for the placement criteria and the warrant criteria. And then here they've supplemented, uh, you'd have the option to supplement the trail warning sign. Again, this is not the same sign that's used in the METCD, but it's that bike and symbol, bicycle and pedestrian symbol combination that you can use in combination with the pedestrian hybrid beacon. Another option is the use of a rapid flashing beacon. Uh, these can be used at trail crossings. Again, you can swap out the pedestrian sign for the trail crossing sign. And these are actuated by the user to generate the flashing strobe that you can see in the photograph. Lastly, we have the standard operating beacon. Again, these are all in the METCD. And it's the designer's choice as to which one of these is appropriate for your particular circumstances. Uh, but the standard beacon, um, may or may not be actuated at the trail crossing, and it flashes at a rate of one flash per second. Those are supplemental engineering treatments that can be used at a mid-block trail crossing, and they can also be used at side path crossings. Uh, may, may be used at both, depending on your circumstances. Uh, with that said, I want to talk about what the ASTO guide talks and describes about side path design uh, because it's a little, there are some, there are some unique considerations that come into play for side path design versus mid-block. Primarily with the interaction with turning motor vehicles, which is not uh, found at mid-block trail crossings. So here's an example from Seattle where you have a busy, the Burke Gilman Trail, very high use trail, uh, high volumes. Um, it's close, and this is where you typically would be marking a crosswalk, but this is actually a shared use path. You can see here's a circumstance where you have a very high volume use, and so it has its own uh, particular design needs. If this was a two-stage crossing, you would have to be able to have refuge islands that could hold large numbers of people in the refuge, and obviously it could be, could be challenging. So what may be required is that you look through uh, signalization techniques to allow these people to have their own phase to cross, or they get some advanced phasing. Uh, but this is just a great photograph of the success that we have with our trail systems. They can be very, very busy. So I think it's really great that the a new ASTO guide really clearly defines a side path as a distinct type of trail from uh, a mid-block trail uh, because of the operational considerations at intersections. Uh, side path is adjacent to a roadway with motor vehicle operation. Uh, this, uh, this new guide is, consolidates all the discussion to one location, which simplifies the user's, the designer's uh, uh, efforts to try to understand what a side path is and what the considerations are. So now it's a, a written about in one location in the ASHTO guide. Um, it talks about some of the operational challenges that come from side path design. It also acknowledges um, locations where it may be desirable to have side paths. It provides guidance on when and where these facilities are appropriate, and it provides additional information on what to do at side path design intersections, which I'll talk about.
Some new information that had come out since the last AASHTO guide update was some research out of Florida that looked at side paths and their proximity to parallel roadways. Uh, well, this research was limited to just Florida. It was enlightening in that it started to provide some, uh, some evidence that there is a link between the proximity of a side path with an adjacent parallel roadway and, and the trail user safety. And the initial research is finding that on roads where speed limits are uh, 50 mile an hour or faster, it's very desirable to have more separation between the adjacent parallel roadway so that those motorists have time to decelerate, turn, and then start to process uh, the upcoming trail roadway intersection. On roadways at lower speed limits, the trail can be closer to the intersection. I think uh, historically we've been used to the concept that a side path is generally within 5 or 10 feet of the parallel roadway. I think the new guide, as, we've, as it's been de detailed and as it relates to this research, you're going to start to see a lot more nuance and discussion of the location of side paths and proximity to those adjacent parallel roadways. The photograph below is an example where the trail is actually set back from the adjacent roadway probably by about 75 to 100 feet, which causes it to not be part of the signalized intersection that you see at the, at the, uh, the far in the view. You can actually see the traffic lights. So this trail crossing is actually not signalized. Now that creates its own uh, challenges for the designer. And again, so you have to think about your context of whether this is a, a good place to have, whether it makes sense to have the trail be further from the roadway or whether it should be bent and merged up closer to the parallel roadway. Generally found, again, in the, the research at lower speed that increasing separation, as shown in this picture, does not reduce crashes, that the crossing should be uh, closer to that parallel roadway. Side paths may be considered in situations where the adjacent roadway has very, very high speeds and volumes, and there's no practical alternatives for improving on-road conditions by adding shoulders or bike lanes, or there's not an adjacent parallel on-road route that may be desirable in those circumstances to provide side paths. These are very common on state DOT-owned roadways and suburban-type roadways not throughout the United States. A side path may also be considered or desirable for short distances. If they're connecting other trail segments, uh, maybe regional trails that really have mid-block crossings, but uh, to connect between them, it may be parallel to a roadway. It may be desirable to connect a local street system that is fragmented by some arterial street crossings, or it may be helpful to have two or three block segments of side paths to create an otherwise continuous local street system for the cycling, cyclists. Which this is, comes up a lot when you get into bicycle boulevard design. Side paths may also be desirable or maybe an option when, if they can be built where there's very few roadway or driveway crossings. You don't have a lot of intersections. You should also keep in mind that uh, side path safety can be compromised if they're not terminated in a proper location because they can result in wrong way riding. So it may be desirable or acceptable to design side paths when you know that at the termini of your side path you have good transition to your roadway or trail network. Some important considerations with side path design are the intersection safety with turning motorists and approaching motorists. It's, it's an unexpected situation for some motorists to be turning and have same direction trail users coming at them from, from parallel to them while they're turning. They're not looking or expecting trail users and bicyclists to be operating from that direction. So there's some discussion in the ASHTO guide that actually lays out a series of situations that it provide these different considerations of where the motorist's attention is focused at different points in time while they're navigating a, a side path crossing. And likewise, what's happening for the cyclists? You know, what are they looking at in relationship to, to turning motorists? And these are just a few of the graphics from the guide. The key thing is to understand expectations for both users and then what are the blind spots so that when you're thinking about your design, you can try to mitigate them as best as possible. 
kind of a busy drawing, but if you can hone in um, and see the roadway design in the middle of the double yellow line, all those little blue boxes are cars potentially turning in and out of driveways. This is not an uncommon type of situation uh, on suburban roadways or roadways that have got very commercial oriented. So if that green line is a theoretical side path, you know, this may not be a good location for a side path design. You're going to have a lot of conflicts between turning motorists who are looking first for gaps in traffic and then secondarily they may or may not see the trail user, the trail off to the side of the road. So generally the ASHTO guide recommends to deploy and utilize access management techniques to to minimize some of these movements and conflicts. And that comes with driveway consolidation, uh, constructions of medians to eliminate left turns from the roadway or, and across the roadway, which cuts down on the number of conflicts. Here's an example where that's been applied in a suburban context, where you actually have driveway consolidations, limiting them to just a few locations. And you can see here that trail actually tapers back away from the road, it sets back about 50 feet from the parallel roadway to a defined crossing point. And then you'll see there's a median in the roadway so that motorists aren't turning across it. You know, it's a safer road design for motorists and it actually makes a much safer design for the side path. Again, coming back to the actual intersection now, I'd like to talk about the intersection a little more closely. So coming back to the to the picture that we talked about earlier that Eric talked about, in the very dark area is the functional area of the intersection. That's where cars are routinely stopping for traffic lights or uh, other traffic control devices. So uh, the lighter gray area is generally where you have kind of a free-flowing traffic movement. And that's why the mid-block trail crossings typically don't have uh, situations where there's congestion or stop vehicles across the trail blocking it. But at side paths, it can be regular. The crosswalks can be blocked regularly uh, by skewed traffic waiting at a stop sign, yield sign, or a traffic signal. So it's a key concept to really get familiar with what functional area of an intersection is. Key consideration when we're looking at uh, signalized intersections where we have side paths is that we are designing primarily intersections for pedestrians. We're designing for the slowest speed user. Uh, when you design a traffic signal, you design in the pedestrian clearance time to determine the, the length of time that is required for the crossing. You may get a four seconds or seven seconds of, of solid walk, and that's the legal time that a pedestrian can enter the crosswalk. That's also the legal time under most state laws when a, when a bicyclist can enter the crosswalk. So four to seven seconds is, is common. Uh, on many roadway situations. Sometimes that walk period can be extended longer, but as a minimum, they're, they're typically four to seven seconds. And under situations where you have a lot of traffic congestion, you'll often see that it's only the minimum that is provided. I think it's important for people to understand that. So what is designed then in is the pedestrian to enter the crosswalk. They've just stepped off the curb, and now the crosswalk starts to flash, don't walk. And now you, you calculate your clearance interval. Now, all of this is found in the METCD. And you can get those formulas. They're not regurgitated in the ASHTO guide. So as the pedestrian is walking through the crosswalk on the flashing don't walk, the bicyclists are also are able to finish their time. The thing that, you, that happens, though, is that the cyclists, because they move so much faster, they often can enter the crosswalk after the walk signal. They're technically not entering at the legal portion of the face. In operations, you have a couple different options. This movement can be happening con exclusive, where they have their own time and there's no turning motorists across them, or it can be concurrent, where there's turning motorists turning across the uh, crosswalk. Generally, at signalized intersections, the signals are visible to all the users. So the photograph on the left is a good example of what is not an uncommon scene around the United States, where the stop signs are posted to on the trail at the intersection that are intended only for bicyclists. Uh, this sends a confusing message to the cyclists and is discouraged in the ASHTO guide. 
generally the trail should be incorporated and integrated into the adjacent signalized intersection if it's signalized. So the trail user should be uh, given their own signal or brought in with a pedestrian signal. At signalized intersections, a couple countermeasures you may want to consider is, you know, a fully protected uh, crossing is obviously the highest degree of service you can provide to the trail user where there's no conflicts of turning vehicles. The other considerations would be to provide right turns on red where crosswalks are regularly blocked uh, by motorists turning right on red. Well, and the lastly is considering the leading pedestrian interval uh, to give them a head start. At uncontrolled side path locations, the key design criteria the ASTRA guide recommends is reducing the speed differential between turning motorists and the path users, trying to slow down the turning motorist speed so that they can react in time to approaching trail, uh, trail users coming into the crosswalk or in the crosswalk. This can be accomplished by traffic coming on the roadway or geometric design at the intersection to slow the speeds. And lastly, uh, any, the ASTRA guide recommends reducing the frequency of driveways. Sight lines were talked about by Eric um, to talk about trying to strive for yield control, uh, yield control as a uh, preferred treatment for the trail user. Since they don't want to just, uh, we generally cyclists want to maintain momentum. Uh, sight lines are determined by the operating speed of the trail user. So the Astro Guide now talks about the concept of using geometric design to get target speed. This can be utilized to actually lower the approach speeds of cyclists is such that you can get a yield control sight triangle. Here's an example on the right where you can actually in, implement some curves to get a target lower design speed, which actually reduces the size of the sight triangle. This can be an effective strategy to allow you to have a lesser degree of control at the intersection. Uh, it's a very site specific and context specific decision to apply this type of treatment. The guide also talks about the use of centerline stripes to reduce conflicts along the trail and approaching intersections, it provides additional guidance of when and where that could be useful on the approaches to, to intersections. Restricting motor vehicle access is a frequent concern at side paths and trail design, and the guide strongly recommends that the use of bollards not be that bollards not be utilized or gates, such as you see in the photograph at the left. They are hazardous have been documented to be a hazard to trail users and can cause crashing, uh, such as the bollard on the right-hand side at the, the, the end of the bridge. <coughs> the Astro Guide speaks that preferred access management techniques uh, are to use other devices, such as splitting the trails you see here in this photograph, um, and not using vertical bollards, that they're much more visible to actually see is trail split. In the event you need to use a bollard or determine you need to use a bollard, it's preferred to use a flexible bollard so that if it's struck, it can be pushed over by the cyclist and it doesn't cause them to, to fall down. But lastly, if bollards are utilized, as if uh, inflexible bollards are utilized, which may be required, such as this location near a bridge uh, where they're installed for security reasons, then the goals are to, the guide, the guide explains some principles for the bollards. One is that the bollards be reflectorized and that bikes can pass through them without having to dismount. That good sight distance is provided in advance of the bollard. That you use striping to actually highlight the envelope for cyclists as they approach the bollard. Because often when a cyclist is following another cyclist, they can't see around them so that the addition of the pavement markings allows them to, to visually see on the approach to stay away from that fixed object. And it, it mentions also some other, ide other design ideas, such as setting the bollards further back from the intersection so that the cyclist first navigates the bollard, and then they can focus their attention on the upcoming roadway crossing. That concludes our um, presentation today for intersection design. Uh, the next webinar is November 6th, and that's on bikeway maintenance and operations.
we invite you back to that. That'll be our final webinar in this webinar series, and we appreciate your, your time. At this point, we're going to turn it over to questions, and we'll let James handle the uh, Q&A portion of this. Uh, thank you, Eric and Bill. Uh, we've received plenty of questions today, and uh, I'll start going through those. Where would you recommend a side path? So uh, where we would recommend the side path? Well, generally speaking, um, if, if you can have a situation where you, you have, can reduce the number of crossing conflicts, um, they can make sense. And as Bill talked about in the presentation, um, areas where there just isn't a feasible on-road facility and you perhaps need to make a short connection, uh, a side path can make sense along, along a roadway. Great. Um, does the new guidance prohibit cycle tracks, or, or how do side paths compare to cycle tracks? It's a very, uh, there's a lot of similarities between side paths and cycle tracks, frankly. They're both located at the edge of the road, parallel to where the motor, motorists are operating. It's a question of context of how much separation there is. This guide does not prohibit cycle tracks. Uh, it doesn't discuss them explicitly. The NACTO guide is the resource for explicit discussion of cycle tracks. But I would say the ASTRO guide principles that we talked about of, of good quality side path design, having good sight lines, and then the principles of managing your intersections and applying appropriate traffic controls, they all apply to cycle track design. You need to understand all of them. If you want to design cycle track, you need to be very proficient in using the Astro Guide and uh, trail design information to, to successfully design cycle tracks that minimize conflicts at intersections, which are inherent in both cycle track design and side path design with motorists. Um, so again, I, I think it uh, I think it's important to understand that uh, they kind of go hand in hand together, and that uh, this guide doesn't prohibit them, but it doesn't speak to them. At, explicitly as cycle tracks in the Astro Gun. Is there any legal obligation for motorists to stop and yield for bicyclists at crosswalks? Uh, depending on state law, there is, and once they're in the crosswalk. And that's, that's kind of the hitch, and I think that's the challenge that a lot of engineers struggle with, um, and, and the public struggles with this, honestly. Um, this concept of mutual yielding, it, you know, it's the, it's the concept of if I'm in the crosswalk, I have the rights, but it's the chicken and egg problem. We, we all acknowledge that you have, to extra, you have to be in the crosswalk to get your, get to right of the crosswalk. And that's where the challenges come in of high volume roadways, uh, multi-lane roadways. It can be very intimidating to step out on that crosswalk to exercise your rights. So the pedestrians are looking for gaps in traffic, and that's why we've talked about um, that's why we talked about that a little bit today, of understanding gap acceptance uh, for trail users and, and pedestrians in particular. Um, when it comes to the law, uh, I think that's also why we talked about the, that speed differential issue. You know, a lot of times the discussion comes up, higher rates of speeds of cyclists approaching, it, it kind of in, it can be a challenge. If it's too high and cyclists aren't stopping, um, it creates a situation where it can be, it can be very risky for them and and or for the motorists uh, approaching them. So the, you know, this guide really expands the concept of understanding sight lines, applying sight lines, uh, well, thinking about yield control. And it's, it's really important component of this, this challenge of the mutual yielding uh, situation we have with our existing present state laws. OK. Um, are bike signals allowed or desirable at trail intersections? Um, well, the guide, uh, it doesn't get into actual bicycle signal heads because um, they're not in the MUTCD, although it does talk about putting in a standard signal head and then a sign that uh, says that that signal is for the, for the bike movement. So um, in a sense, a uh, signal head for bikes is allowed uh, in, the, uh, in the AASHTO guide. So it's a situation where it might, 
might be desirable to have a bike signal, for example, at a trail crossing and be a way to mitigate uh, or, uh, the challenge of the right-of-way situation where the cyclist is technically only allowed to enter on the walk si signal. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that bicyclists primarily are operating on a roadway system where they're seeing traffic signals. So then you're asking them to, to, to flip their attention on trails to look for pedestrian signal heads. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion recently about looking at the use of bike signals for trail crossing uh, to deal with that challenge and to try to get higher rates of compliance for cyclists on trails that signalize intersections. When considering a reduced speed approaching an intersection, what is an appropriate uh, design speed? Um, so in the, in the last uh, webinar, we, we talked more about uh, design speed, and we said that um, really only under rare circumstances would you want to go less than the, the 85th percentile speed of the user, user you're trying to accommodate. So for a normal cyclist, that's about uh, 14 miles per hour. Um, so really you would want to really consider um, if you wanted to go less than that, uh, you've really got to think about site specifics. Now, in the, in the speed control section of the guide, it actually mentions a, an absolute minimum of, of eight miles per hour. So the key is, is the site specifics, uh, the room you have to do um, some chicaning or putting in some curves, and then uh, you know, what speeds uh, does, does that equate to. And, and when designing a crosswalk based on a road speed, should you go at the posted speed limit, or if you know that cars are going faster than the speed limit, should you work off of the anticipated speed of what drivers are really driving? Well, some of that depends on, on local policy. Um, I, I, I think as a designer, I would, I would tend to look at the operating speeds um, and, and design for that or use that in, in consideration of, of an appropriate design speed. Okay. Um, one of the questions I got from several people was, you would mentioned that the ADT was 1,200 and 1,500. Should that have been 12,000 and 15,000? I'll come back to that. Ask the next question. I'm going to look it up in the METC right now. It may have been a typo. Okay. When would you consider a median refuge over a curb ex over curb extensions? Um, that's a good question. Um, so we would consider a, a median refuge would be really more appropriate on a on a, a higher speed, higher volume road where you you want the path user to really kind of accomplish crossing one direction at a time. Um, and particularly on a multi-lane road where you would want that refuge uh, in the middle of a multi-lane road. Um, curb, curb extensions um, I think would make more sense on a, on a lower speed or lower volume road, perhaps with on-street parking. So to create kind of a bulb out to, to restrict parking at the path crossing and, and build a curb extension at that location, that, that would help with sight lines from the edge of the road um, and it's even a traffic, a little bit of a traffic calming, and um, but then you would, um, if it's a two-lane road, let's say, the need for some kind of median refuge would be would be less important there on a two-lane roadway where you could head on street parking and you could do a curb extension. James, I got the answer. To you. It was a typo in our presentation. I apologize for that. Uh, we had a very astute observation out there. It is actually 12,000 is the cutoff, and it didn't seem right as I was reading it, and I should have recognized that in the proofing. I apologize for that. So 12,000 and 15,000 are the correct numbers. But I think for everyone's reference, it's, a, it's an important part of the METCD you should look at. And I'd refer you to Chapter 3 of the METCD, page 384 where you can actually see the full explanation of uh, this discussion of crosswalks and when other engineering, supplemental engineering treatments are recommended. And it also, we reference that in the AASHTO guide, those numbers as well. And I know uh, those numbers are correct in the AASHTO guide.
Thank you. Um, going back to the uh, refuge islands a little bit, are there any square footage recommendations for refuge islands? Um, I've seen, um, again, I would look at your local DOT. They probably have a policy. Uh, I believe the Astro Green Book also has some rules of thumb as, in a sense. But I, I'd say what I, I'm going off the top of my head, so I may be wrong, but 100 square feet is a recollection I have. Uh, the minimum island size. And I think the thinking behind that is that you don't want it to be so small it's not noticed by the motorist as they approach it. Uh, but that said, I've seen very small uh, you know, traffic circles in Seattle that are certainly less than 100 square feet. So again, I think it's important to remember these are guidelines, uh, but you may have a local policy that's set as a minimum that you should be aware of. Okay. Uh, many times we see paths intersecting with each other or there are forks or gradually uh, diverging paths. Does the guide address how to handle these types of intersections? Um, in principle, yes. Uh, it doesn't really get into uh, the specifics of it, but um, it, you know, the guide does point to good uh, intersection design principles and just like for roadways, um, having Path intersections with other paths that are as close to 90 degrees as possible. Um, it just helps to understand um, the, how the path will function and improve sight lines. Because many times when you have a, a gradually diverging path, that's two two-way operation uh, from another path. It can be confusing as to uh, which side a, a path user needs to pass another path user. Um, so Creating that crossing as close to 90 degrees as possible is, is just good intersection design. Okay. Um, are there any design treatments for side paths through a high pedestrian volume plaza? Um, I'm not sure I understand the plaza part, but I would just say, let's just assume it's a side path that comes into a busy pedestrian intersection where the pedestrian volume is generated by things other than the trail itself. Um, certainly, you could have a parallel crossing. You could have a side path crossing separate from the pedestrian crosswalk as a, as a design approach. You know, we don't detail this explicitly in the ASHTO guide, but um, I think there's a lot of flexibility. You, you can have a combined crosswalk that's wider than, than 10 feet, for example. It could, um, you know, it's, you should consider the combined volume of, of the users at that location. And uh, that might be one place where it's rare, but it's a situation at high volumes where the highway capacity manual formula for designing crosswalks based on space actually comes in handy. Uh, so that might be something you want to refer to. OK. If the yielding sight triangles don't work, wouldn't you always put a stop sign on the path? Uh, no, not, not necessarily, um, and as we kind of mentioned before, we really have to think about um, the hierarchy of, of, the, of the path system uh, versus the roadway system. So again, if you've got a, a big commuter trail, regional trail, and it's crossing a small local street, then you would, you would put a stop sign uh, on the street. Would you ever put a stop sign for the path on a side path crossing at a signal? No, I mean, as Bill, as Bill pointed out, that, that can send a confusing uh, message. So that at a signalized intersection uh, where you have a crossing, you, you would typically have a pedestrian signal or um, perhaps a, a signal head for bikes. Um, but then also putting up a stop sign uh, would just confuse the path user. And I think a way to think about that, is, this comes up a surprising amount, and it, I think a way to think about it is put yourself on that cyclist approaching the trail, and they see the signal, they see the stop sign, but you as a designer say, well, the stop sign's only for the cyclist. Well, then that means that when they stop and then they see no traffic, then they can proceed, regardless of what the traffic signal says. If they see a gap in traffic, uh, and clearly, that doesn't make sense. So I think it's just thinking through the implications of that decision. I think if you're in a situation where you 
you're designing this and you think that this is a, a, a need for a certain, to protect them, then you should take a closer look at the operations of that signal and see if there's ways to get a, an ex exclusive crossing for that, that, that crosswalk or to relocate it so that that crossing is further away and outside the area of the, the signal operation where it's more of a mid-block crossing. Okay. Does placing a yield or a stop sign on a trail change the mutual yielding, how the mutual yielding concept works? Uh, no, it, it doesn't. The mutual yielding is still there. The, it's, it, that's there by virtue of the crosswalk marking or, you know, in many states uh, at a side path, um, the markings aren't even necessary and you have that, that mutual yielding behavior. Really what the stop or yield sign does on the path is, is more of a control for the cyclist who's approaching at speed that, um, again, if, you, if they've got the sight triangles that they can yield to crossing traffic, then they can proceed across, and if they don't, then we need to stop them. Um, and when they yield and come to a stop or at a, at a stop sign, um, and then they wait for that conflict to pass, and they're ready to start up again, um, that mutual yielding is in effect. If they move into the crosswalk and then a, a vehicle comes, uh, that vehicle has to has to yield or stop to to the path user. Okay, you briefly discussed rapid flashing beacons. Are they approved by FHWA? Yes, that's an approved. They've been issued interim approval by Federal Highway. And. And are there any concerns using those for a bicycle crossing? Uh, one, one attendee pointed out that the bikes can activate the crossing but don't have the legal right of way. Well, again, it depends on your state law, but they can activate that crossing and then the, the issue of the legal right of way is going to come down to, does your state law say that the, the cyclist has to dismount and walk to have the rights of a pedestrian, in which case um, in that state, they would have to get off their bicycle after actuating the rapid flashing beacon and walk across the road to have that illegal protection of the crosswalk if they were to be hit. Um, if it's a situation where they can ride at close, sometimes these laws say at closer to a, a slower speed or a pedestrian speed, but some states allow cyclists to ride through the crosswalk. So in those states, if they actuate the, the button and they don't dismount and then they slowly ride through the crosswalk, then they, they still have the legal protection. Now the key in both those cases, again, is that mutual yielding concept where they don't just come suddenly out in front of a moving motor vehicle that doesn't have a chance to stop for them. They can't just step out in front of them. Speaking about the, the concept of having to get off the bike, um, one person commented that where they live, the law still requires bicyclists to get off it and walk through the intersection or across the crosswalk. Uh, and that policy tends not to be followed or enforced. Um, is the guide moving away from that recommendation? The guide doesn't, it doesn't address it directly. The guide is designed, the principles of the guide are assuming the cyclist is not dismounting. When you factor in yield control and all those calculations in the, dis the general discussion of the guide, it assumes the cyclist is moving, not dismounting and having to walk through these intersections. That said, the premise of good intersection design is they're designed for pedestrians who are walking. If you design an intersection very well for a walking pedestrian, it should function very well for cyclists, as long as, the, again, the, the sight lines are available for the appropriate traffic control. Okay. With with the fifty mile per hour uh, with fifty miles per hour being a breaking point, do you mean that the speed limit of the road that it, uh, the path is crossing, or that is parallel to the path? Uh, that particular slide was the discussion of the Florida research that um, has been in, informing that the um, it's relatively it, it's. The research out of Florida that was looking at side path safety, and they were looking at does the proximity of a side path crossing to the roadway, the parallel roadway, 
is it safer if the path's closer to the intersection, closer to the parallel roadway, or further away? That study found on roadways with posted speed limits, I say posted, 50 mile per hour or faster of the parallel roadway, not the crossing roadway, that on those circumstances it's better for the path to be further away from the roadway if the path crosses. Okay. Um, we still don't have, you know, hard and fast dimensions on how far it is at, at this point, but I think these, I think this is promising research that is going to continue to inform the next edition of the guide in the coming years. Should bicycle crossings always be marked at the intersection? Uh, this question is that uh, they have somewhere the pedestrian crossings are marked with bars. Uh, but the adjacent bike crossings are unmarked. Not sure I understand that. Is that a bike lane crossing? I don't know. It sounds like they might be, well, we'll talk through two scenarios. One is there's trails where bikes are, uh, where trails are designed to separate users. So you can find these in Denver and a couple other places in Minneapolis where Bicyclists have their own space on the trail, pedestrians have their own space. In those locations, it may be desirable to have a marked crossing that uh, is either combines them into one at the roadway or they could be marked separately. Uh, you're talking about a bike lane parallel to a crosswalk. Um, you have the ability to mark extension lines through an intersection of the bike lane that may be parallel to the crosswalk. Um, there's not provisions in the guide currently for bicycle crosswalks or bicycle markings. Okay. What is the maximum distance before an intersection that a side path crossing becomes a mid-block crossing as opposed to an intersection crossing? Not really a question of distance. It's a question of that is the side path crossing or is the trail crossing occurring within the functional area of the intersection? And again, the test for you, just without looking, you know, if you're just to go out and look at an intersection, if you're seeing motorists regularly stopped for traffic control and they're queued up through and across the location where they would be trails crossing, and that would most likely it's a side path uh, intersection. You know, if it's, you're going up to the trail crossing and there's never motorist stopped other than to stop for a trail person crossing the road in the trail, then that's probably more mid-block oriented. We don't yet really have hard numbers. And again, I think that Florida research is a good first step of, of defining, you know, the cutoffs between the two with an actual number. But I think it's very context-based depending on volume traffic type of road you're crossing. Is there any guidance where side paths cross channelized right turns? No, not not specifically. Again, I think all the, the principles that we talked about um, with side path crossings in general and good pedestrian design you know, would apply um, if you have channelized islands. Yeah, and I think those principles are, you know, good sight lines to the crossing point, slow motor vehicle speeds, uh, treatments that encourage and promote yielding if that is the desired outcome. Okay. Are bicyclists must dismount signs at trail crossings enforceable? I would I would think so. I mean, it would be it would definitely depend on the uh, the state law, the local law. Yeah, if your if your state law, if it's a reminder sign of the law that to cross the roadway, say it's a mid-block trail crossing, and for a cyclist is required by that local state law to dismount and be a pedestrian to have the rights of a pedestrian, then they may in fact post signs such as that, um, and then police could enforce it. Okay. Most of the examples shown had marked crosswalks, but no textual modifications to the pavement. 
Is changing pavement textures at crosswalks uh, undesirable? Um, not necessarily. Uh, you know, that can be a local design decision. We would say if you'd have a, you know, a textured crosswalk, um, that at a minimum you would want the the edges of that to be uh, the white pavement marking, just to make the make them more visible. Okay. You mentioned crosswalks. Oh, sorry. So I was going to add in the METC does not recognize an asphalt stamp crosswalk, a decorative crosswalk, as a crosswalk. And I think it's something people miss. Uh, if it's considered a marked crosswalk, it must have must have two white lines as a minimum parallel. That can supplement any of these decorative crosswalks. If, if you're looking to have a marked crosswalk. So I think it's an important distinction that if you're doing a mid-block crossing, for example, that you don't just do a decorative crosswalk, that you actually, to give the legal rights of it being a marked crosswalk, it, it requires the two white parallel lines. All right, thank you. Uh, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned crosswalks being recommended at all crossings, uh, for example, mid-block crossings. Uh, this questioner has seen guidance leading away from the practice of certain of that in certain situations. Can you expand on that recommendation and why you wouldn't want a crosswalk marked? Um, I think if it, if you ever have a location where there will be a path crossing the roadway, you would want a marked crosswalk. Um, what what may be happening here is somebody um, looking at at that study of the safety effects of marked versus unmarked crosswalks and, and saying that they can't add the treatments or, or do the engineering that makes it a safe crossing and therefore uh, any crosswalk is not recommended. But if you're going to have a path crossing a roadway, you want a marked crosswalk. Okay. For motorists having to cross a side path to enter a roadway, they often pull into and block the path for visibility and may block the paths for many seconds. Should path users yield to the blocking motorist or should they pass the, the motorist either in front or behind the vehicle? Well, it really, um, I guess it really depends on who's there first. I mean, if you've got cars queuing um, in a crosswalk and then a, a path user approaches, they would, I wouldn't recommend going out and weaving through traffic. Okay. Sorry, I'm just flipping through the questions here. I think we have time for about one more. Um, so why you flip? I'm sorry? You ready? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, at the intersection of a side path and a minor street, if the side path is only a few feet from the parallel street, how would it ever be practical to put a stop sign on the minor side street if there is no room for a vehicle to stop between the parallel street and the side path? The, the stop sign should be placed prior to the trail crossing, not at the edge of the roadway. So the motorist approaches, they stop and look if the trail crosswalk is if there's no one approaching and within close proximity to them and they, they can safely pull through the crosswalk, and this is the same as our previous question of the driveway, uh, then they can do so. And then they look at the adjacent, their next job is to look at the uh, street and see as they're approaching traffic, and then they can go straight, left or right, whatever their circumstances are. Uh, but the placement of that stop sign should be prior to the crosswalk. So it's just like a normal stop controlled intersection. Um, you'd have the stop sign on the roadway approaches, and the, the path would essentially be a crosswalk um, in that intersection. It would really look like a normal inter stop controlled intersection with crosswalks. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for discussion. I'm sorry if we did not get to your question today. Once again, a PDF copy of the slide presentation will be available at www.bicyclinginfo.org slash ashto later today, 
and a recording of today's program will be posted in a couple of weeks. Be sure to check our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash petbike, for updates. Also, we will be conducting the final webinar on our Bike Guide series on November 6th. We hope to see you there. Uh, finally, I want to remind you that a very brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. Again, we very much appreciate you taking a, a moment to complete it. Thank you again to our speakers, Eric Mongelli and Bill Schulteis, and thank you to all of you for attending today's PBIC webinar.